let me ask you something to start this video off. Do you like to play dress up? Well, I certainly do. And I think that deep down inside, just about everybody does. All right, I get it, you are hardcore and don't play silly girly dress up games. But how about Elden Ring or Dark Souls? How's that blithe armor looking on you? Or maybe you prefer to run around naked with a pot on your head. Uh, do you use a giant ungabunga club just because it makes you look like an unwashed caveman? That counts as dress up. Or maybe you've been playing a MOBA or an FPS. Have you spent any real life currency lately updating your in-game skin wardrobe? If you're an adult male, do you play a female character in an MMO and tell people you do that because you like to stare at her when the real reason is because the female characters get all the cool outfits? Well, it's all dress up. It always has been. The underlying, even stereotypical concepts of games for girls, such as riding horses, dress up, raising a family, and playing with dolls are universally enjoyable even by the manliest men when they are boiled down to their fundamentals and provided with fun mechanics and awesome presentation. You might look down upon and joke about Barbie Horse Adventure or Star Stable, for example, but maybe you still adore the horse mechanics of Mountain Blade Bannerlord in Skyrim. Maybe you'll scoff at playing The Sims because it's like playing with dolls. But gentlemen, at the end of the day, EU4 is just dolls and spreadsheets. In other words, there's nothing inherently unfun, shovelware-esque, or low-quality about girly activities or pursuits per se. But why then does the industry largely treat girls' games like shovelware? Where are all the quality games for girls, and of the ones that exist, why are small, usually indie developers the ones making the most quality girls' games? Why is the best horse game Red Dead Redemption 2? Why? Well, if you're a male, particularly a straight cisgendered male like myself, these topics may never have crossed your mind. What even is a girls' game? Well, to make it very simple, a girl game is any video game developed for and targeted to girls. Most of us guys in the late Gen X to early Gen Alpha cohort grew up with a whole host of games to play. Some of us were Sonic fans, others were Mario fans. We had the gunslinging sci-fi of Halo, the sword-swinging fantasy of Zelda, and the carjacking degeneracy of Grand Theft Auto. And when we tired of those, we had Starcraft, Madden, Street Fighter, you name it. Growing up, all of us guys had many different games and genres to play marketed towards us. And there were so many choices that most young men couldn't possibly have played all the different games on offer. Most of us were specialists in one game or another. But if you ask a woman born in the global west from that same generational cohort what games they played growing up, you get a weirdly universal set of experiences. In fact, for all the women in the audience, let me see if I can predict some, but not all, of your core memories as a gamer. Correct me in the comments if I missed anything, starting from the very top. Barbie Fashion Designer, Harvest Moon and Sequels, Nancy Drew and Sequels, Neopets, a Ham Taro game, likely Ham Ham Heartbreak or Ham Ham games, Barbie Horse Adventures and Sequels, Gaia Online, Flash-based dress-up games such as the ones on Girl Go Games, Nintendogs and Sequels, the Pet series with horses in particular, Rune Factory and Sequels, Style Savvy in 2008 or Style Savvy Trendsetters in 2012, Farmville, The Sims 2, 3, or 4, Kingdom Hearts and Derivatives, Maple Story or a derivative KRPG like Windslayer, Cooking Mama, Cocoa Play in 2014, Love Nikki in 2015, or a derivative of phone app dress up game, Mass Effect Dragon Age or both, League of Legends or some other MOBA until it got too toxic and you quit, Stardew Valley, The Legend of Zelda but for some reason specifically Wind Waker or The Minish Cap, any Fire Emblem game after Awakening, Pokemon, an Otome like Mystic Messenger, Don't Starve, every single Animal Crossing game, Gary's Mod if you're older, Minecraft if you're in between, and Roblox if you were younger, and the one FPS you really like is either Splatoon or one of either Overwatch or TF2 but seldom both. For Gen Z, Fortnite and Valorant might also make an appearance. If you're mid-Gen Z to early Gen Alpha, Gotcha Life. If you're late Gen X to Boomer, Candy Crush. And if you're especially into JRPGs, you might have also played the Megami Tensei series, the Persona games, the world ends with you, Professor Layton, and the Ace Attorney games. And if you're into Ace Attorney, your favorite character was Miles Edgeworth. Did I get most of it? It's almost criminal that there are so few decent games that were even tangentially made for girls or women that you can rattle off a list of experiences like this and capture so many of them. Well, there's a reason for why there are so few quality girls games. Let's take a look together at the rise and fall of the girls games movement and the consequences it had on the video games industry. In 1983, during a presentation at the Boston Computer Society, an executive of Coleco, makers of the ColecoVision video game console, noted that their new home computer named Adam was being marketed specifically to boys ages 8 to 16 and their fathers. 
he would go on to state, we believe those are the two groups that really fuel computer purchases. The executive was then booed by the audience. In response, the executive simply replied that the marketing strategy was based on consumer research. Indeed, in the 80s and 90s, virtually everything computer-related, be it video games, arcade games, personal computers, or otherwise, was male-dominated. The machines were largely invented by men, built by men, and marketed to men. In 1988, Nintendo would publish a study showing that 27% of NES players were female. In 1993, Computer Gaming World found that only 7% of its readers were women. But although the apparent population of women gamers and software developers was small, there were still women at that Boston Computer Society meeting booing that executive. Women in the gaming space have always existed. The venerable 1981 arcade game Centipede, for example, was programmed by one Donna Bailey, the only woman in Atari's entire coin-op division. And though women like Donna Bailey made important contributions to the video game industry, they would never be given positions of power enough to make games that were meaningfully designed specifically for women. The video game market of the 80s and early 90s was not much different than the girls' toy market. Girls' games were primarily on CD-ROM as market research suggested that girls didn't own consoles. Those CD-ROMs were colored in pink and purple to both appeal to girl gamers, but mostly to signal to their parents that these were the games for girls, their feminine appearances and poor quality inadvertently associated with each other to the consumer and thereby essentially segregated. These are the games for guys, and the terrible games for girls are the ones in pink sitting in a section by themselves. Now let's be clear, I'm not saying that all girls games in the 80s and 90s were terrible. Quite to the contrary, in fact. There were many excellent games for girls, but a lot of them didn't sell very well, weren't marketed well, and most of the best ones were Japanese. Believe me, you haven't lived until you've played Bishoujo Senshi Seramun Supa Asu Fua Fua Penikuni on the Super Famicom. And who could forget, Crystal's Ponytail on the Sega Genesis, a game panned by Game Developer Magazine for, I quote, featuring too much pink. If you're interested in especially old games for girls, by the way, I direct you to the excellent collection and catalog of those games over at the Femicom Museum at femicom.org. In any case, it wasn't until arguably 1995 that a company would be founded by women for the express purpose of making games for girls. This company was called Her Interactive, and it was founded by Patricia Flanagan, Vice President of American Laser Games. The company was founded as a division of American Laser Games, but would spin off into its own independent entity and then would eventually buy out its former parent company. Her Interactive's first game was a dating sim called Mackenzie & Co, available for Windows 3.1, Windows 95, and Mac OS. Perhaps, rather predictably, many of the major publishers at the time would refuse to distribute the title, citing that there wasn't a market for girl-oriented games. Here's the funny thing about markets, though, and niches. If there's demand for something and the market doesn't exist, that's an opportunity to make a market. And that's exactly what Her Interactive did. Mackenzie & Co. would sell 40,000 units by early 1998 and over 80,000 copies of the game in its lifetime, which was an impressive number back then. Especially for a game that struggled to find publishers and was building its own market. Now, Mackenzie & Co. wasn't perfect. You played a high school junior trying to find a date for the prom and you could choose between Kim, a cheerleader, or Carly, an actress. The game was criticized for being quite stereotypical even for the time. But still, progress is progress. Without this step, there may not have been other steps. Almost all progress, given enough time, becomes cringe, but it's only cringy because of how much progress we've built on top of that foundation. It's cringy because of how far we've come since. In any case, Her Interactive would go on to release a series of games that you may have actually heard of and played. They developed the Nancy Drew Adventure series, an ongoing series of games that began with Secrets Can Kill in 1998 and which continues to Midnight in Salem, which was released in 2019. This time period in the 90s also saw toy company Mattel releasing many games under its Barbie franchise. These games included Barbie on the NES and Barbie Supermodel and Barbie Vacation Adventure on the Super Nintendo. Those initial games had very poor reception, but Mattel did not give up. In 1996, Mattel released one of the magnum opuses of girls' games, Barbie Fashion Designer, on the PC. Barbie Fashion Designer took the market by storm, and in many ways was the vanguard of the girls' games movement that would follow. The game looks primitive by modern standards, but it was arguably the first thoughtfully developed dress-up game, and it obliterated the idea that there was no market for girls' games. Barbie Fashion Designer was the ninth best-selling PC game of 1996, a year which featured competition like Quake 1, Civilization 2, 
Command & Conquer Red Alert, Diablo, and Duke Nukem 3D. Barbie fashion designers sold more than 500,000 copies in its first two months, outselling Quake and even Doom. And yet, look at any top 10 games list of 1996, even narrow it down to PC games, and Barbie fashion designer will never make an appearance. I would argue though that Barbie fashion designer's impact on the video games industry was as substantial, as important as Quake or Doom or Diablo, and perhaps even more so. In any case, after 1996, it was like the industry's collective eyes had been opened. In 1997, major media outlets began reporting on girls in the games industry and girls as gamers. The mentality that games could be only for boys and men was shifting, and it was shifting very quickly. 1997 also saw the rise of a company many of you 90s women may recognize, Purple Moon. Purple Moon was founded by video game pioneer Brenda Laurel, and was an American developer of video games that were targeted specifically at the audience of little girls based on the novel idea of conducting research on what those little girls actually wanted to play. The result was the highly regarded Rockets series of games and the Secret Paths series of games. Purple Moon was in many ways an attempt at cultural intervention. A company founded by women making games for girls driven by research into what girls actually want to play. Founder Brenda Laurel had a dream of making a more inclusive, more progressive video game industry that could get girls interested in entering the field of tech. But some dreams arrive before their time. And here is where our story takes a turn for the worst. Remember what I said about markets and niches earlier? If there's demand for something, and the market doesn't exist, there's an opportunity to make a market. What happens though when you try and cross those wires? What happens when there isn't a demand for something, but you try to create a niche anyway? Purple Moon's research into girls was meant to uncover what girls actually cared about so that Purple Moon could cater to what that market demanded. However, that research came back with a curious result. When Purple Moon asked girls what they were interested in, the girls surveyed talked about boys and fashion and gossip and horses and feelings of belonging and exclusion. In other words, perfectly normal 90s girl things. And these things didn't necessarily line up with the image of empowerment that Purple Moon was hoping for. Purple Moon wanted to create games with values at the forefront, but that's not what the market little girls actually wanted. Little girls didn't want to be preached to, they wanted to have fun. And at the same time, an older cohort of gamer girls was also coalescing which strongly desired more meaningful games but found none available that were made specifically for girls. The end result was that Purple Moon was making games that nobody was asking for. Here are some actual quotes from girl gamers of that time period. These excerpts are taken from Justine Cassell and Henry Jenkins' book, Barbie to Mortal Kombat, Gender and Computer Games. Stephanie Bergman from Game Girls states, Barbie is not really a game. You point, click, do all sorts of things, but where's the competition? Where's the adrenaline rush of winning? It's not there, because girls don't like that. The girls games companies have their place, they really do. But I think as long as they refuse to acknowledge that they're only making games to satisfy some little girls, they're enforcing a stereotype. As a kid, I loved Pac-Man. I loved Miss Pac-Man even more, not because she was female, but because the gameplay was better. Nikki Douglas from Girl Gamer has one of my favorite responses in the book. She starts by quoting Sherry Turkle of MIT who stated, It's a problem that little boys like to play games that slaughter entire planets. It's not particularly a problem just of the computer culture. To which Nikki responds, Maybe it's a problem, Sherry, that little girls don't like to play games that slaughter entire planets. Maybe that's why we are still underpaid, still struggling, and still fighting for our rights. Finally, Eliza Sherman of Cyber Girl writes the following. Looking at the games on the market today for girls, I get a little concerned. Where are the games that teach them competitiveness, assertiveness? I keep reading about articles and studies where experts say girls don't like shooting and blasting games, but instead prefer quiet, contemplative games with well-rounded characters and storylines that simulate their imagination. I adventure to say, however, that these studies are a reflection of how we condition girls to be passive. What all of these responses have in common is a rebellion against the notion that girls only want to play girly games. 
But let us do as the lawyer do, and dissect that just a little further, shall we? How exactly are these girls defining a girly game? Well, a girly game in their headspace is a game that reinforces the oppressive, learned passivity stereotypically associated with femininity. Let's break down what each girl says. Stephanie Bergman says, Barbie is not really a game. Why isn't it a game? Well, there's no competition and no winning, thereby enforcing a stereotype. What stereotype? Passivity. Nikki Douglas says, It's a problem that little girls don't play games that slaughter planets. That's why we're still fighting for rights. The implication being that the games that they do play teach them a stereotypical passivity juxtaposed against the proactive aggression of destroying a planet. And Eliza Sherman says, you can't find games that teach competitiveness or assertiveness. Passive games are a reflection of how we condition girls to be passive. With this understanding, we can see the issue much more clearly. These games are saying girls games are boring and that they reinforce a culture of passivity and complacency for women. But here's how the industry of the late 90s interpreted what we just read. Market research says little girls like pink and dress up, but don't care that much about quality. And that older girls like quality but look down upon girliness as being patronizing. And as such, the industry totally missed the point. As Purple Moon continued to make the girls games they envisioned, built around their lofty ideals, the actual market of girls appeared to increasingly reject the premise of their games. Following a period of financial struggle, Purple Moon was acquired by Mattel in 1999. Girls Games Incorporated, another similar company, would file for bankruptcy in 1999 as well. And the learning company, which had many educational, motivational games for girls, would also collapse and be acquired by Mattel in, you guessed it, 1999. And just as suddenly as it arose, the girls' games movement collapsed. Let's return now for a moment to our premise from the very beginning of the video. Why does the industry largely treat girls' games like shovelware? Where are all the quality games for girls? And why are small, usually indie developers, the ones that are making most of the quality girls' games? We'll get to the horse thing, I promise. Well, the answer is that the games industry remembers the collapse of the girls' games movement and believes it has internalized the actual lesson of what girl gamers want. The industry believes, based on their market and historical data, that little girls want pink, passive, girly games when they are young, focused more on the appearance of girlishness rather than fun mechanics, and then just regular old quality games when they get older. There isn't a place in the calculus for quality, girl-specific, feminine games, or even necessarily games for women. And there weren't very many women-led developers like Purple Moon left, to say otherwise. The industry at large, blinded by the failure of the girls' games movement, is missing a crucial piece of the puzzle that some smaller devs have already figured out. The older girl gamers want to play good games. The industry sees that girly games sell well amongst children even if they are shovelware, but older girls don't want feminine games because they are bad. Well, the missing piece of the puzzle is obviously that older girls and women would play feminine games if they were good games. The conclusion here seems extremely, extremely obvious, but that conclusion is only just permeating its way into the video games industry, and largely due to the influx of women developers into the field of video game development, a topic that is a deep well of its own. Girls don't want to play bad games, and nobody does. Most girl games are cheaply produced and of poor quality because the industry believes that the market has told them that nobody wants quality girly games. And so there are very few good games for girls. We gamers often complain that video game reviewers are hesitant to give anything lower than a 7, and so we believe anything underneath that isn't worth playing. But girls games are considered relatively good if they can get above a 4. That's how few true girls games, or even girl-friendly games, there are. There are also some exceptions, of course, as we will discuss. And there are also some games that are popular amongst women and girls that weren't developed for or marketed towards women. They just happen to be popular amongst women and the marketing development shifted to meet that unexpected success. I also briefly alluded to the fact that while the idea of girls games as shovelware was for a long time the prevailing perception in the West, it was not always the case in Japan, as we will also soon see. But back to the point. The association of girls games with shovelware is so strong that even the best girls games are denigrated merely for their girliness, by both the industry and by players. And if you ask me, 
that's just not a fair assessment. The Americans amongst you might be familiar with beloved childhood educator Mr. Fred Rogers, a personal hero of mine. In 1969, Mr. Rogers was brought before the U.S. Senate to deliver a speech in support of public funding for PBS, the American Public Broadcasting Service. In this speech, he spoke about understanding the inner needs of children, how his program doesn't have to bop somebody over the head to make drama on the screen. His program, he said, dealt with things such as getting a haircut, or the feelings about brothers and sisters, and the kind of anger that arises in simple family situations. In other words, Mr. Rogers is saying there is plenty of drama, plenty of intrigue, plenty of consequence, in the very day-to-day -day feelings and dynamics of children and adults alike. The meaningfulness is all there. Life is inherently meaningful and interesting, but we can fail to capture that meaningfulness if we present it poorly. As you continue to watch my videos, you will likely hear me say the following line quite a bit. A great video game is merely a combination of mechanics and presentation. If you can make the mechanics fun, and the presentation awesome, the game will be at least good. The drama and difficulties and desires of girls, even young girls, are compelling. There is both value and meaningfulness intrinsic to every part of the female experience, including but not limited to stereotypically feminine hobbies, characteristics, and pursuits, just as the same is true about the male experience. It is up to developers to capture that compelling nature through good mechanics and respectful not pandering, not patronizing, but respectful presentation. Because let's be clear here, there's a lot of room here for terrible and even sexist representation. And just to illustrate, there are already some classic, brilliant girls games made and marketed towards girls that meet the standards of mechanics and presentation but are virtually unknown simply because they are girly. Dismissed out of hand because we associate the presentation of games for girls with shovelware mechanics. Take, for example, the Hamtaro series of games for the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance. These are games that are as charming and thoughtfully developed as any Zelda or Mario game. And why wouldn't they be? They are produced, after all, by Shigeru Miyamoto. Yes, that Miyamoto. But unless you were a girl in the mid-2000s, it's not likely that you ever played Ham Ham Heartbreak or Ham Ham games. And that's a real shame if you ask me. I probably played Ham Ham games more than my darling little sister ever did and I don't regret that one bit. Games like Ham Ham Heartbreak, Style Savvy Trendsetters, and Barbie Horse Adventure are great, not just because they are fun, but because they are girly. There is value inherent to conceptual girliness, and to play a quality girls game can validate girls' experiences and give them the self-confidence to express themselves freely, whether that is through dress-up and makeup, or deagles and ops, as the case may be. Girliness in games can be beneficial for mental health, self-confidence building, gender affirming for trans women and trans girls, and much more. The industry is slowly becoming aware of not just the value of a quality girls game, but of the massive untapped market that exists therein. A market that indie devs, from the humblest flash game paper doll maker to concerned ape, are happy to cater to in the meantime. Mooney, this all sounds like it's building towards a conclusion, I can hear you say. And we haven't talked about horse games yet. Oh, we're going to talk about horse games, all right. We are going to talk a lot about horse games. Because you would think, right? You would think that horse games would be a no-brainer to make. There should be so many excellent horse games out there. The market exists. The mechanics are demonstrably both possible and fun. The fandom is extremely vocal, and yet there are no triple A, or even double A, or even single A, quite frankly, horse games, arguably. Did you know that the highest revenue horse-related game is a Japanese anthropomorphic racing horse girl collecting gacha game with ties to Japanese gambling interests called Ume Musume Puretti Dabi? Why is that? Why? We've talked a lot about the value of girliness in games and how there's a substantial market of girls and women that have been neglected by the industry. And yet, there's a corollary here. Sometimes the best way to make a great game for girls is just to make a realistic, high-quality game about girly subjects without making the presentation overly gendered. Sometimes that really is just what girls want. And that's why the best horse game is arguably Red Dead Redemption 2. And I happen to know that there are many horse girl gamers who play Red Dead Redemption 2 or Red Dead Online because there are so many different breeds of horses you can befriend, and they act relatively realistically. I mean, the heads could use a little work and the gates are a little rigid in the joints, but eh, don't worry about that. 
In Red Dead Redemption 2 and Red Dead Online, your horse has a personality. You can ride it past scenic vistas and take beautiful screenshots of you and your companion. You can be friends with your horse in a meaningful way. And one of the most important fundamental joys of equestrianism, of horses, is the open plain and the wind in your horse's mane. And that does not require and is not bettered by a gendered portrayal. Girls games are necessary and important. We need more quality games that are feminine and girly. We need the industry to rise up to fill the gap that exists there. But the flip side of this is that not every game that appeals primarily to a female audience needs to be girly, either. Sometimes the games that girls actually want are also bettered by tempering gendered portrayals. I understand that this video doesn't have anything to do with law, but I think that a wider discussion on girls' games is sorely needed. My understanding of girls' games, the history of those games, and the direction of the industry is shaped both by my two little sisters, but also by the work of brilliant commentators whose opinions I've come to trust and internalize over the years. Individuals like Alice Rupert over at the Main Quest or voice actress slash show writer Ashley Birch. More and better girls' games will be a benefit to us all. And if you haven't yet, give some of those classic girls' games a try. See how you feel about them after playing them, with what I hope is a refreshed and renewed perspective. Girls games deserve to be so much more than just shovelware. This video is a bit of a departure from the last two videos, but I hope it was still interesting. I'd like to occasionally stray from topics about law to do lighter topics like this one, as assembling increasingly complicated and long videos on topics involving law and video games requires very substantial effort. Shorter videos with either more historical or cultural premises can act, I hope, as a break between heavier legal topics for both of us. But let me know what you think as I try these videos out. As always, 10% of Moon Channel's gross revenue goes towards charity. If you liked today's video, please consider subscribing on YouTube and joining us on Patreon. I've been your host, Mooney, and thank you for tuning in to Moon Channel.